Friends, let us begin our sermon together not with speaking or hearing, but with singing. We're going to sing a song, it's an African American spiritual, and this song is about the promise for a better world, a better land. And it was originally written during a time of slavery in our country. And we're going to sing the first verse together. It is 1018 in your hymnal, so the words are so simple. Come and go with me to that land where I'm bound. I don't even know if you need the books. So maybe just look up out of your books and look up at each other. Let us sing. We can just stay seated, okay? So as we ask each other to come and go, come and go with me to the land that we're bound for, which means, what it means is not settling for the way that the world is, to not give up, to not hide in the suburbs, and instead look to shape the world that we want for our kids and our kids' kids, and turn away from all the trauma and the drama of Facebook and social media and CNN and from bully pulpits that we often feel so bound by this season, you and me, I have a request. Will you allow me to, and, and Otto and Heather too, just to preach it plain this morning? Did you say briefly? <laughs> <laughs> And friends, we preach together, by the way. We preach together because sermons, what they are, is not my talking and you listening. Sermons are a conversation. And I want us to not worry together if we're going to all come across as preachy or not. It's tough to be a preacher and not be preachy, let me tell you. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Because sometimes what we need from each other are open, honest, direct words. Words that are not filtered through the oil of a campaign machine and certainly words, certainly words that are not designed to provoke, taunt, divide, hurt. What a week. As the dad of a 13-year-old girl, what a week in the world of words. So what we instead need, actually, are words that come from love. Even as they lead us, those words of love, to reckon with some discomforting spiritual work, as I will talk about, and then humble work, as Otto will talk about, and invite us to do the work of imagination, as Heather will do. This work is the work of practice. I love the word practice because it, it reminds us that it takes constantly getting up every day and we mess up and so we try again, and we try again, and we try again, and we try again. But I'd already pointed out, so let us first turn around, friends, and all the way in the back you just have to take our word for it, the banner above the, um, the choir loft. And what do we see on the left of the words? What is that? It's a heart. And what do the words say to the right? So I want to explain the heart first. The heart is an expression of our Unitarian Universalist faith, that we, that we hear the call of love, as Kathy sang for us, as the choir did. And the words, they are an expression of a movement that began in 2012, you may remember when 
a 17-year-old black kid, black boy, Trayvon Martin. He had a hood on and he was killed by George Zimmerman because George said he looked threatening. Do you remember that? And that movement, Black Lives Matter, after that happened, moved from there to demand justice and accountability for the ways that black lives are treated differently than, than my life. Especially my life as a white, heterosexual man. And they're treated differently by police and by the state and by, by all of us, actually. By the white majority. So here, here's the plain part. Brief. We hang this banner inside this morning, and then beginning this week outside, we're going to hang it high between the welcome flag and the symbol of our church, the chalice. Because we want to affirm our Unitarian Universalist faith to build with discomfort, yes, and humility, yes, and imagination, absolutely, a world where black lives matter as much as my life, and for those of you who are white, as your life too. And we hear this call because we want to affirm the worth and dignity of every person. That is one of our founding affirmations and principles of our tradition. And when that inherent worth and dignity is diminished because of a person's race or sexual identity or gender identity or class or zip code or religion, this is what we say. We say that every single one of us in this room suffers. The one thing, you always ask me, what do you use believe? You always ask me. Because we don't have a creed. We have a covenant. But I can, I can tell you that one thing that we do believe is that what affects one person affects all of us. That's what we believe. Or as King put it, injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. That's what he meant. Now, all of this, this plain part, you know, sounds great. And you're going to, I can nod along to that. You can you know, nod your head with me. It sounds good. Sure, we'll do that. Until we, remember, until we remember that this principle of ours, that there is inherent worth and dignity in every person, and what, what affects one person affects all of us, well, you know, it asks more than sermons. It asks something from me and from you. And one of those things that it's going to ask is to actually talk about racism and white privilege. And especially the discomfort that hanging this banner out front will mean certainly for me as a senior minister here, but also for you who may be asked to explain why it is you hang that banner from your church. Don't you go there. All of that I'm asking you to do via our first principle without running for the doors or asking me to preach on different things or expecting that it's my job to keep you happy and comfortable or maybe stay at home in the safety of your Sunday brunch or look for another church. It's tough to be in community. But things of value are tough. So here is the uncomfortable part, the uncomfortable practice. I as a almost 45-year-old guy, white guy, have work to do as a person on this issue of race and navigating my white privilege. I have work to do. And guess what? Guess what? <laughs> I got a whole lot of company. <laughs> well, that's good news. It's good news because we have each other. And the work that I have to do is for the longest time I have heard, I grew up in very segregated St. Louis City. I grew up hearing and then believing that what was asked of me 
My parents told me this as a good person, good kid, good Catholic kid trying to be a better kid, that it was my job to have a certain color blindness. Like, why can't we all just get along? And don't all lives matter? And what I've heard this here, what we really need in this community is more people of color to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. Hmm. Or as the author Toni Morrison has put it, for the longest time, the habit of ignoring race, ignoring race, is understood to be a graceful, even generous, liberal gesture. That feels true to me. That's what I heard growing up. But times are different now. Because as a consequence of feeling that way and hearing that, maybe even preaching that, my friends, in my 15 years of preaching with you, I have, I, and you have too. We have avoided, like Rip Van Winkle, avoided having some of the uncomfortable, difficult conversations with ourselves and with each other about how our privilege means not having to think about our privilege. That is the definition of privilege. And what it means that black and brown people have a very different experience than the experiences that I have. You know, because it's, it's true, it's true that on an existential, universalist, theological level, in the eyes of God, it is true that all lives matter. Absolutely. But actually, that misses the point. What's also true when it comes to the state and when it comes to police, when it comes to getting access to the economy, across all kinds of real life, on the ground issues, all lives do not matter the same. That is true. And that is what that sign is about. So we have work to do. And that work means hanging a sign that's going to be polarizing to some people who drive past, the hundreds and hundreds of people who drive past this church every day. Because it's going to open up conversations about race in your life that are not happening. I guarantee you. That's going to be uncomfortable. Please do not ask me to feel otherwise. Please. It's also going to mean owning up to how our color blindness and our desire to have more people of color in this room so that we can feel better, it means we have to let go of that and actually ask us a little bit more about what our white privilege has allowed us in these very, very, very homogeneous, racially homogeneous communities that you and I live in together. Holliston, Millis, Sherburne, Ashland, Hopkinton. It also is going to mean all of us who are so very busy, who almost sometimes, like I do, like wear my busyness as a badge of pride because all of my activity makes me somehow feel better about myself, right? It's going to mean having to make room to put out some of that busyness and to make room in my life and in your life to make a commitment to make a commitment to having these hard conversations. If you have had um, reason to come by my office this fall, you will have seen a sticker on the door. It says, well-behaved churches seldom make history. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the same could be said for communities that place a premium on staying safe and comfortable and happy and satisfied. The same could be said for that. The good thing then that we have open hearts, open collective hearts as we hear together the call to stand on the side of love. We have each other to lean on and to give support and we have each other to call each other on our stuff because here we get to practice. We get called on it and we try again to be better. Which is why we're going to sing again, Come and Go With Me to That Land. 
I want to invite you into this practice of humility. One of the scariest things, I think, for those of us who are white when doing this work of anti-racism is accepting that there is work that needs to be done. Work that we can't see without the help of others. It's not that we don't believe in fairness, equality, injustice. It's that sometimes we simply can't see that that work is needed. In our experience, for those of us who are white, often it seems people are treated fairly. We don't notice ourselves making judgments on others because of their race. We move through the world thinking that people of color, that black people are treated the same way that we are. So when we hear people of color say, this is unfair, this is unjust, or the police aren't killing your people the way they are killing mine, it's easy for us to say, what? No, no, can't, it can't be. Surely I would have seen that. But wouldn't we all, surely if there was such, such injustice in the world, I would know. It can't be. Which is a totally reasonable thing to think. Because it's not really just that our pride gets in the way of this. It's that our intense, it's our intense desire for this not to be true. Because wouldn't we all rather live in a world where, impression, where oppression wasn't real? Wouldn't we? Amen. Wouldn't we all rather live in a world where the inherent worth and dignity of all people was acknowledged? Yeah. So for those of us, for those of us who are white, to accept this truth that that's not the world we live in, that can be very difficult, right? Yeah. And in some ways, we think this because we want to protect ourselves from the shock and devastation that accepting such a truth might bring. From the shock of the reality that our own experiences, for those of us who are white, are not the baseline. <laughs> not the norm, not indicative of the experiences of all people. And the reality that if we do know this, if we accept this truth, then maybe we have to do something about it. I know, because I felt this way. And if you think these things and feel these things, it's so easy to think, why can't we say all lives matter? Doesn't that make sense? Isn't that what's fair? But my friends, this is, this is some of the hardest work. Because for those of us who are white, we have to acknowledge that maybe the world isn't what we thought it was. And that takes humility. And I want to invite you into that humility. This concept, the religious concept of humility, that is present in many religious traditions, is a humbleness before God. It's saying, I don't know what I don't know. I accept my limitations. Humility means acknowledging one's limits to our talents, to our gifts, to our experiences. It's acknowledging that there are things that we simply do not or cannot know. And I have to tell you that as a white person living in the United States of America, knowing the experiences of black people is something that is beyond my limits. I have to rely on what others are telling me, on the voices of black people, on the voices of other people of color to share those experiences with me. Because it's so easy for me not to see it. Because it's too painful to see it. And it's hard because it's hard to say, I don't know what I don't know. But the truth is that I don't. And so when I think about this work in the movement for black lives and what we as a congregation can do, when sometimes it feels like we are so far away from the news, where we see these, these different environments, these urban environments, and we think, I, I, just don't, I just don't see it here. I go back to the practice of humility. Can we recognize that we have much to learn? Can we recognize that we don't know what we don't know? Yes. And it isn't as far as we think, 
we can look at the names on the Holliston police report. One thing I hear a lot from folks engaging in this type of work, in this work of talking about race, maybe talking about race for the first time in this way, is that the real fear that many of us have, including myself, of making a mistake. Can I get an amen? If we make a mistake, we will embarrass ourselves, we will feel shame, we will make others uncomfortable. And I'm here to say that yes, all of that might happen. But if we practice humility, we can understand that making mistakes is part of this process, and it is sacred work. Our mistakes can be gifts to help us to a better understanding. And as Nathan said when he spoke, spiritual practices are practices for a reason. And humility can be one of the hardest things to practice because it involves saying, we don't know. It involves saying we need help. It involves surrender, which opens us up to the pain of the world. But when we wake up to injustice, when we open ourselves to the pain in this world, we can see when we can imagine a better future. And we can see why it matters so much to proclaim Black Lives Matter. Amen. Come and go with me to that land. Let us sing again that first verse. So this week, I looked up at my bulletin board for the first time in years, the one I've had since high school and has moved with me, the board that's become the dumping ground for all the stuff. And I see this torn off piece of an old envelope with a quote that I had jotted down, and it came back to me at just the right time. It was a quote from Zeus Leonardo that said, dreaming spurs people to act. If by dreaming we mean a sincere search for alternatives and not the erasure of reality. And when I wrote it down in college, I think I had this feeling of validation, like yes, someone else feels like it's worthwhile to believe that things could be different. Imagination and dreaming get a bad reputation as a youthful dreaming or the province of children. But I also think that kids are often better at believing that a different world is possible than adults are because they have not had as much time to have to unlearn all of the things that we've been taught. Because imagination is not only the realm of children, it is also the realm of liberation. Imagination as a spiritual practice is a sacred imagination, a radical imagination, a holy imagination, a moral imagination. Moral imagination creates ethics that transcend our own singular experience and asks us to imagine that our experience is only a small part of the whole truth, not the only way to see or experience the world. Moral imagination asks us to practice, and there is that word again, practice imagining, moving through the world with a different experience or perspective or touchstones or values. As a white person in the era of Black Lives Matter, moral imagination asks me to decenter my own experience and to listen deeply and compassionately and openly to the experiences of people of color, to imagine myself into another story, another social location, to imagine that even if I haven't had a particularly negative experience or interaction with the police or criminal justice system, that my experience might only be a small part of that story. Moral imagination asks us to deeply regard the humanity of others. And although it might feel like a loss sometimes to give up that safety and security, the surety and comfort that we have around our assessment of how the world is ordered. Moral imagination also promises that there is more wholeness and more connection and more humanity in store for us on the other side. Imagination helps us to build a better world, to see something that may not be realized tomorrow or next year, but to give us something to work toward. It asks me to put down the purely pragmatic lens that I can sometimes wear, to take that lens off, that walks around with that cynical voice that says that the world we dream about isn't real, 
that a world without a prison industrial complex or violence against people of color or an astronomically high education or income gap, that that world can't be possible. Imagination asks me to more loudly say, what if it were? Adults are often really, really good, for the record, at doing this with kids, this practice with kids, right? Like when a child says, I'm the dragon and you're the knight, and the child says, roar, the adult doesn't go, that's not real. <laughs> the adult says, ah! But we're less good at engaging that imagination with one another. We jump to the, but how will we fund it? How, that's not possible. How would we get from here to there? Too often letting us stay in that place of an inaction, admitting defeat before we've even tried. And I know this is true for me. Is this true for you? I think there are two sacred words that can help us to pause and consider and reflect when we're in that space. Those words are what if. What if my own experience is not the only way to see the world? What if there are alternatives to policing in this country as we know it? What if we didn't criminalize drug charges? What if we had ways of dealing with harm that didn't involve locking up so many black and brown men? What if everyone had access to their basic needs, food, education, health care, secure housing? What if I talked with my white neighbor, my Facebook friend, my uncle, and it went well? What if everyone actually had an equal voice in the decisions that affect their lives? What if a better world is possible? New ways of living cannot become reality unless they are first imagined. And what is that land where we are bound? I have to say, I don't entirely know because it, but because it is not only mine to dream up. We can only do that in community. I do know that I've had visions, glimpses of beloved community, for me most often in religious spaces. A community of wholeness and real democracy and genuine care for one another. But I also know that we do not live there yet. Amen? And we still have work to do to get there. Amen? But we can be compelled by that vision. Amen? In imagining a world in which black lives do matter, as much as every other life, religion is a bridge between this world and the world that we imagine. Where all lives matter, that world where all lives matter, and that is actually reflected in our social systems. But the world we live in now is a world in which black people are not treated as though they matter. And as people of faith, we are called to build that bridge between the world we live in and the world we dream about. This banner, this proclamation, is just one step in building that bridge. As we proclaim to the world around us, as Unitarian Universalists, we believe that black lives matter because we are using our moral imagination to build a world in which that is actually the case. And while we are on the road, until we get there to that world we dream about, we are proclaiming over and over again, black lives matter, black lives matter. I invite you to join in singing all four verses, rise and join in singing all four verses of come and go with me to that land as we boldly take steps toward that land where all of us, black, non-black, people of color, white, all of us are bound.